Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Sharf Show here on 99.1 FM WIUX. It has been a great sports week this past week. Uh, football, we got some news in football. We got a big, big deadline coming up tomorrow. Basketball, whether it be NBA or college basketball, the Knicks, whoo, who would have thought? Baseball spring for training keeps on rolling. We got the World Baseball Classics coming up very shortly. And then, of course, we have hockey. We have the trade deadline, which we'll get into, and just some plain old good hockey going on after the moves. Some, some good hockey. But it is March 6th, so it's not just a special sports week for me. Happens to be my dad's birthday, so uh, dad, a very special uh, shout out to you, happy birthday. But we got some sports to get into. That's because today, on this day, Derek Carr, he's officially off the market. He signs with the New Orleans Saints for four years, $150 million for $37.5 million per year. Um. I think it's a little much for Derek Carr if you're saying um, like how I value Derek Carr. I'm not one of the ones who values Derek Carr as highly as maybe others. But if you do value Derek Carr as a top half of the league quarterback and you think he can get back to his Pro Bowl level play, then this is a good deal for the Saints. It's not in the fours. Um, which it shouldn't be in the force of somebody like Derek Carr. It should be in like between the thirty-five to forty million dollar range. If you thought he was going to get twenty-five million dollars, you're crazy. That's just not how the market is anymore. And it's not too long where they can get out after three years. Um, if they want, they can draft a quarterback in a year or two years to sit behind Carr if they want to. Um, I, I like this move for the Saints. I don't think it's too pricey. Um, I don't think the term was too long either, get it for getting out after three. Um, overall, I, I like this deal for the Saints. I'm curious to see because apparently Michael Thomas said that he loved this move uh, or said something like that on Twitter. I just don't know how Michael Thomas is back, so I'm curious to see he's talking about how he thinks he's fitting himself into the equation. He's got to know he's not coming back with that salary cap. Here, so, so it's kind of curious to me. Overall, but what this does affect also is the is the market for Daniel Jones. Now, some people say it will affect the market for Lamar Jackson. I disagree. I think Lamar is in a completely other category. Um, you know the type of money per year Lamar wants, and the Ravens are willing to give it to him. It's the guaranteed money, and it's just fully guaranteed. That is the difference: fully guaranteed versus non fully guaranteed. That's basically the difference in what we see if Lamar gets or not. I don't think. Any of these other quarterbacks are going to affect his market because I think he's going to get forty-five to fifty million dollars per year, and I don't think Derek Carr changed or affected that. But what he did, I think, affect was Daniel Jones's market, as um, there are reports that Daniel Jones and the Giants are close, and it should, it, it could get done before the franchise tag date, which is Tuesday, which is huge because if they can sign Daniel Jones. Well, then guess what? Saquon Barkley is going to get that franchise tag, and he will not have the opportunity to go to free agency, which is huge, absolutely huge. So why does I think this affects his market? Well, because I think Daniel Jones and, it, and their team know that Joe Shane has leverage because they can just tag him, and he's nowhere near going to get $40 million, and he's going to get around $32 million this year, which is not what Daniel Jones wants. He wants more money, and he wants it guaranteed for more than just this next year, because if Daniel Jones regresses again, he's not going to get it. He's going to get it. not a huge contract. They might even let him walk. I don't think that's going to happen, but I'm, I'm playing the scenarios out. So they want a long-term deal. So Joe Shane and the Giants have some sort of advantage, and seeing this deal, I think, that Joe Shane can be like, hey, you, don't, you may have... You play probably play better than Derek Carr, but you don't have the experience. You don't have the longevity that Derek Carr has playing at higher levels. You don't have as much tape playing higher levels. So, I, I think this deal is pretty similar to what you should get. I, I to be honest, if I was Joe Shane, I'd copy Carp and Pace this. I'd say, hey, we'll offer you this: three years, 150 mil, 37 and a half mil per year with 100 mil guaranteed. 
or 110, 15 million guaranteed, around that number, I, I think is a pretty good deal, in my opinion, for both sides. Uh, I mean, if I, as a Giants fan, I wish Daniel Jones would get between the 32 to $35 million range, but that's not going to happen. It, it's just not from way, the way the, the, this is going. So I'm just hoping, as a Giants fan, it's under the four. We, do, we see a three to start, not a four, a three. And I'll be real, realistically, realistically, decently happy. And for Daniel Jones' camp, like this hurts because I think him and Carr are pretty similar. Uh, again, he had a better year last year, but Carr has a longer resume. So they're kind of very, very similar. So I, I think Shane, along with um, him having the advantage of the franchise tag deadline being tomorrow, I, I do think he signs for around 37 and a half. I think this is probably, I, I wouldn't be shocked if this was the exact contract also that Daniel Jones were to receive. Now, this was not the only big thing happening in the NFL this week. Because about an hour north of where I am is where uh, in Indianapolis is. And right there was the NFL Combine. There were some pretty interesting storylines to go there. I am not one who thinks the Combine is the end-all, be-all. I think um, you have a certain grade on somebody from just watching film and getting to know them as a person. I think that's also huge more than the actual numbers they put up, getting to know these these kids, these uh, college kids, as and who they are as a person. What, what do they represent? What do they like? What's their attitude? Um, how do they look at the NFL? How do they look at football? But... Numbers-wise, I think it just, you have your grade, but if you have very similar grades on one or the other, it might help put one over the other in terms of rankings. I don't think it's going to dramatically change a grade. I think it might help you a few notches. I don't think you're going to go from the third round to the first round, or at least I don't think you should. But maybe you go from early third to late second. You know, It helps you between like 10 to 15 picks as those numbers kind of help weed you out from the rest of the talent grade where you were, where a kid was. So there were some big there were some big big got or big numbers coming off the combine from some players. The biggest one being Anthony Richardson, the quarterback from Florida, um, probably one of the most. He's it's, it's so weird as a prospect because he's, some people love him because he's so raw, and people compare him to Josh Allen because. If he turns out to be good in the NFL, he's going to be a top five, maybe arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. But he also could bust and be not a very good quarterback at all. There's there's not a real in-between with Anthony Ray. He's either going to be really, really good or not very good at all. And seeing his athleticism at the Combine was crazy. Uh, he set co quarterback Combine records in the vertical jump at 40 and a half inches. Um... He set the broad jump uh, co combine ver uh, record for a quarterback with 10 feet 9 inches on the broad jump. And he finished fourth all-time uh, for quarterbacks in the 40-yard dash at a 4.44, which is cra crazy, crazy numbers for Richardson. Again, I think, I don't know if this affects um, Richardson that much. I think it puts him overall, he's going to at least land, I think, in the top 10. And I think he's now quarterback three ahead of Will Levis from Kentucky. Um, maybe somebody likes him more than Stroud and Young, and he goes higher. But I think that solidifies him as minimum, going uh, the, at least as the top three quarterback in this draft. I don't think it affects him too much, though, because I think just watching the tape, he knew how athletic this guy was. So it's not that big of a shocker seeing these numbers. And I don't think people... I'm like, oh my God, this completely changes our opinion of Anthony Richardson. I think it just more solidifies, like, this guy is exactly who we saw on tape. Um, there was a couple other big guys that stood out to me. I think the biggest one uh, being the pass rusher, Nolan Smith from Georgia. Um, pass rusher who put up an absolute shocking time of exact same time as Anthony Richardson, actually. Uh, four point. 4-4 as a pass rusher, which is actually insane. Or he was, but that was the initial time. But he'd actually run a 4-3-9. So he got in the four under 4-4, four, four, which for a pass rusher is bonkers. Actually 
bonkers that he's running faster than maybe some wide receivers, some running backs. He is going to be coming downhill very quickly and going to be a problem for a lot of offensive tackles with his speed and getting out of the pocket. It's going to be a struggle for running backs that coming out of the flat or quarterbacks trying to scramble to get away from him. So it, it's it, along with his tape and his combine, is just going to help boost that stock even more. Like I said, I don't think it's going to completely like make him a top five pick, but I think it just really helps solidify um, what you've seen on tape from Nolan Smith. And there are other guys who had a great day. Uh, uh, Will Anderson, who's going to be a top five pick, was great. Um, who uh, Christian Gonzalez, the cornerback from Oregon, who I really like, would love the Giants to snag, looked very good. Um, there, there was a bunch of good. Brian Branch, the Alabama safety, looked very good. So there were a lot of good, solid players, especially on defense. I thought that Anthony Richardson just completely stood out on offense. And another offensive guy was uh, uh, Gibbs, the running back from Alabama. Looked very quick with his 40-yard dash. I think helped solidify him be a first-round pick. But um, cool, cool. See another combine. I always love seeing like how many uh, bench presses and 40s guys can do. And it, uh, I, I, li I love to see how, see how they would uh, match up with kind of me. You know, because I can run that 4-2 John Ross speed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. When we come back, though, Indiana basketball, they have solidified themselves as the number three team in the Big Ten tournament. Where's their ceiling for uh, an NCAA tournament uh, number? Where's their floor? What am I expecting out, out of them for this tournament? What I liked about this week, what I didn't like, all coming up after the break on the Sharp Show, 99.1 FM, WYUX. All right, welcome back to the Sharp Show here on 99.1 FM WIUX. Indiana had quite the week this past week going 1-1, one and one, getting blown out at home versus Iowa. But then coming back yesterday in my final game to watch TJD, in TJD's final game, in Race Thompson's final game at Assembly Hall, they beat Michigan in overtime, 75-73. We're going to start with the Iowa game now. Coming off of this huge, huge Purdue win last week, you knew they had to come validate it. Um, they did it the first time they played Purdue this year. After last year when they beat Purdue, they got they had a disappointing game to Michigan. This year, the first time they beat Purdue, they had a, they won against Purdue, and they had a nice game the game after that to, quote, validate it, as Mike Woodson would say. Well, they went back to last year's performance. They got blown out by Iowa the game after beating Purdue at Mackey, 90-68. to And this was by far the worst defensive um, game all year for Indiana. Uh, they could not fight over screens. Uh, they, could not, uh, they could not force any tough shots. They were getting beat to spots. Um, it, just, it looked like they were, they were getting to the spots at Will, Iowa. Um, they were at bat, whether it be a backdoor cut, whether it be just a simple pick and roll or a pick and uh, pick and pop, um, whether it just be a and literally anything. We couldn't we couldn't switch well, or Indiana couldn't switch well. It, it was crazy. It was crazy to see uh, a, such a good team like Indiana just be so bad defensively. And I know I was a very good offensive team. I do know this, but. I, I don't care. It was that bad of a defensive effort. And it really stung as Indiana could have really, with the losses that happened that week, really had a stranglehold on the double bye and almost a lock pretty much for a four seed. Now they had to go to Michigan. They had to win it at home versus Michigan. They probably need a, a win in the Big Ten tournament, which if you lose to Michigan... All of a sudden, you're sitting at like a seven or eight seat. That's we're going on a much tougher road, a much tougher road. But they come into this game and they had a great first half. Um, defensively, in the first eleven minutes, Michigan had eleven points. Now they weren't hitting all their shots, but we were also playing very tough defense, forcing uh, late shot clock shots. Uh, fighting through screens, making sure you got a hand in the face. If it was in the post, you were seeing the doubles, you were seeing the fight um, that you want to see from this team. And then they kind of let up towards the, the last four minutes 
um, or last three, four to three minutes of the first half to ultimately uh, for Wolf, Michigan to fight back to be down two. Um, they had a terrible start to the second half, but they were. Um, Ray Thompson said they were not going to lose this game. He talked to, uh, he told uh, TJD, he told Jalen Hudgefina, we're not losing this game. He was right. They fought back, um, all the way back to tie the game in over to, to force overtime. And at, in overtime, they uh, they really controlled most of the overtime period, and they end up on top 75 to 73. I thought Trace Jackson Davis was amazing. In this one, he ended up with 27 points, uh, 9 rebounds, 10 of 21 from the field, 7 of 9 from the free throw line. Very important, very impressive with that. Um, but uh, there was just some, the attitude that really I enjoyed watching, or I, I think I need to see more from Trace Jackson Davis, was in the second half. He demanded the ball and went straight. It didn't even matter it was Hunter, Hunter Dickinson, who I wanted him to go after anyway as he started to get into foul trouble. But he got the ball where he wanted to, and he said, I'm going after you. I'm getting to the bucket, or I'm getting to the paint, and I'm putting up my shot. If it goes in, <coughs> excuse me. If it goes in, great. If not, we can live with those shots from your best player. And he really took over in the second half in the overtime, really forcing the defense to either collapse and he kick it out to a guy like uh, Tamar Bates or a Miller Cop who started to turn it on. Uh, Tamar Bates had his best game in a long time, especially defensively. Uh, Trey Gall and Trey Galloway fouled out, so he really filled in that role. Um, whether it be Miller Cop who struggled a bit but hit a big shot late, or Jalen Huchifino, who had a, another nice day from the floor, 4 of 9 with 13 points and a big 3 uh, to tie the game late. In regulation. But Trace really controlled the pace of the offense. When he wanted to score, when he wanted to get his shot, he demanded the ball and got his shot, which is something I want to see more of from Trace. Just get him the ball and let him go to work. There are not very few, if at all, players that can defend him and defend him well. They're going to either stay in single coverage and he's going to score most of the time, or they're going to double, and he can go, and he's a great passer now. He can kick out to somebody for an open three or a, a nice two or a backdoor layup, something like that. So th this, the attitude and, and, the, and the, the really determination to get his shot and get his points was something I need to see more of Trey's coming down the wire in the Big Ten tournament and in the NCAA tournament because now the bit, with Sunday's games being filled, and with the win on Sunday, the Hoosiers clinched a double bye. They were the three seed in the Big Ten tournament. And I'm going to be honest, I love their side of the bracket. I love it. Right now, um, they will play the winner. Uh, so first, before we get to that, uh, tomorrow, I believe it is, right? Tuesday it starts. Tuesday. Wednesday. 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 So Wednesday... The first games will happen that uh, on this side of the, on Indiana side of the bracket will be Minnesota versus Nebraska, the 11 to 14 seed. I assume I think Nebraska is going to win. They've had a nice year for uh, in Nebraska standards. Um, but the winner of that game will play Maryland, and who's the sixth seed? And the winner of that game will then play IU, which, relatively speaking, is a pretty solid um, place. Maryland is a decent team, but they are. Way they are a way different team on the road, or not in their barn versus in their barn. They are a very tough team to beat at home. A very tough team to beat at home when they're not at um, College Park or University Park. I believe it is College Park. I think it is Penn State, but University Park. I believe that's Maryland. When they're not in Maryland, this is a very beatable team, and I like our odds. Then you go play North. The, the, if you won that game, you play Northwestern or. The winner of Penn State, Illinois. All three, though, at least Penn State, Illinois, I think we match up very well against. Uh, we had a poor matchup against Penn State, but I ultimately do think we should win that game. And Northwestern, it's a shot of revenge. Tough to beat a team three times in a row. Um, I thought we didn't play great the couple times we played them. Uh, and I think TJD would really come to play that game. Uh, I, I don't think that's a terror. I don't love our, ma our matchup wise versus Northwestern, but. Uh, I'd rather see them in the semifinals than Purdue. And then if you win that, you probably ultimately end up playing Purdue 
in the finals. Maybe you hopefully a Michigan State or an Iowa win, but how awesome would it be to see Purdue in the finals, IU Purdue, uh, Big Ten Championship. So I, I really like Indiana's path to a, a Big Ten ban. I really do. Um, and I will be, I am looking to buy tickets. I will be there at least for the first game. We'll see how many games I end up going to. But I'm excited. I am real excited to watch uh, Indiana really do some damage here, hopefully, in the Big Ten. And I think if they win the first game, I think they lock up a three seed. If they go ahead and win two games, I think you could see um, a three seed in play. It depends on how the teams ahead of them do. But I think they possibly could be in play for a three seed. If they win the Big Ten, they will be a three seed. Guaranteed. I don't think they're going to be, I don't think they'll be a two seed. I think that's too much of a climb. But I think a three seed is definitely still in play. Um, I think if you win the first one, you're pretty, you're looking like a lock for a four seed, which is the bare minimum I, uh, I'm looking for for IU. But I'm real excited for this Big Ten tournament. I think Indiana can do some real damage here. Um, and in Chicago this week. All right, when we come back, we got the NHL trade deadline to go over and, all, and a bunch of uh, one of the, some of the biggest news I saw from the trade deadline. How about Timo Meyer scoring in his first game as a devil? We'll get to that right when we come back on the Sharp Show 99.1 FM, WIUX. All right, welcome back to the Sharp Show here on 99.1 FM. WIUX, we had the NHL trade deadline officially passed this past week on March 3rd. And we talked about a bunch of trades. Uh, we had our show on February 27th last week. So there were a bunch of trades that we got to, but there were a bunch of trades that we did not see. So we're going to get to those right now. The biggest one, probably the, right, the day after, was Patrick Kane officially went from the Blackhawks to the New York Rangers. We knew it was happening. The official trade is Patrick Kane, 50% retained, and Cooper Zek to the Rangers. Chicago got Billy Sajilar, Saraj uh Andy Wilnowski, a 2023 second round pick conditional, and a 2025 fourth round pick. And the Coyotes, who got involved, got a third round pick for the Rangers for picking up some salary. Um... The Blackhawks' perspective, it's tough because you knew you weren't getting much. I thought they'd get at least a first, but kind of tough. Kind of tough. You knew you weren't going to get much. Ultimately, it is what it is. For the Rangers, it's a huge pickup. Another goal scorer. I will say I wish I, I wish the Rangers added a little more on the back end this, um, this trade deadline or before the trade deadline because they're very strong up front. Their top six are absolutely lethal with adding Kane and Tarasenko, but I'm not a huge fan of their back end. I think it can get a little rough. I, I like Fox. Um, Truba's good. Uh, he said he has his moments, but he hits hard. Uh, he's your captain. Um, you got pieces back there, Keandre Miller. You have good pieces. I just think it's a little shallow, so I would have loved to see them get like a nice depth defenseman who could be that 5'6 and just a nice veteran. But they didn't. But overall, still a great pickup in Patrick Kane. Um, another big one here, let's move on, was Matthias Eckholm going to the Oilers. They were circling Jacob Chikrin, um, but they ultimately fall on uh, Matthias Eckholm. And they only retain 4%. 4% they retain, which is crazy. Uh, low. And they get a six-round pick. They give up Reed Schaefer, uh, prospect. They give up Tyson Berry, uh, the defenseman. Uh, a first and a fourth. So from Nashville's perspective, I love the return. A first, a fourth, and Tyson Berry. Um, you can use Tyson Berry if you want. He's a very solid offensive defenseman. Doesn't give much defensively, but he's going to put up 40, 40 to 50 points for you per season, and he's going to really help you on the power play. Um, so if they want, they can keep him, or they can flip him. You could probably get at least a first for him as well, um, and he'd be a great, great uh kind of flip piece in the offseason if they want to do that. From the Oilers' perspective, uh, losing Barry Hurts, definitely. I think they definitely paid a decent amount for Eckholm, but he's exactly what they need. You don't need more offense with the Oilers. You got McDavid, Dreisaitl, Nugent Hopkins. Uh, Nugent Hopkins having a career right, year right now 
Um, already has the most points he's ever had in the season. Looks like he's probably going to put up more than a point. He's definitely going to put up more than a point per game. He might get to 100 points, which is pretty crazy. I don't, I don't know if he does, but he's on pace to, which is crazy. Um, but, yeah, you have enough offense on this team, so you don't really need Tyson Berry. They needed another defensive defenseman. They have Darnell Nurse. Now you have Eckholm, who's just gonna, it just could be a rock on that on that blue line for the Oilers and really help uh, try to limit their goals against, which has been their biggest problem, especially with uh, their goalkeeping being the issue that it was. I think uh, it's a great pickup for them and, and really stabilizes that defensive core for Edmonton. Um, then we move on. We move on um, the Kings. They did a weird one. They traded Jonathan Quick, which the Kings um, locker was not very happy about. They traded um, Jonathan Quick a first and a third for Vladislav Garikov and Jonas Korpisalo to help shore up that goaltending tandem. Um, it's a weird trade. Um, Quick was not having a great year by any means, but he's been the ca he's been one of the leaders, one of the captains of that group, and I think it's really tough to trade one of those, especially when you're going in another cup run, and you and you know he's been good in the playoffs. So you're hoping he maybe bounces back. I think to be I, I don't know. It might help them get into the playoffs or like solidify themselves as a better spot in the playoffs. I, it's definitely an upgrade, but. Production-wise, but leadership-wise, I think you're losing a lot, and I don't think that locker room was too happy. I think you probably should have gotten the okay from Kopitar before you made this deal, but ultimately for Columbus, I think getting quick, you, they ended up flipping quick, which we'll get to in a sec, but getting a first and a third along with being able to flip quick was a good enough value to do this if you are um, the Jackets. They they do end up flipping Mr. Uh, what you would call it? Quick, they ultimately another couple days later they traded to the Golden Knights for another gold for a gold project prospect. Excuse me, Michael Hutchinson and a 2025 seven. So they didn't get too much. But ultimately, just more pieces. I didn't think you were going to get much for Quick. So the Quick though ends up on Vegas, and I, I like Vegas kind of just taking a shot on him. Uh, might help in the playoffs with, uh, and it might come up big when uh, in big moments as he's done a lot in his career. So and you don't have to play him too much in the regular season. You could just use them sparingly. But the bit of the other massive trade seen at this trade deadline, it was on the day before, actually, the trade deadline. It was on March 1st. It was Jacob Chikrin finally, finally, he got dealt from uh, the desert, from the Yotes. Uh, he goes to the Senators, though, which is not something a lot of people saw coming. He went for a 2023 first-round pick, top five protected. A conditional second in 2024 and a conditional second in 2026. And for the Senators, I love this deal. I know they're not going to make the playoffs this year, but their first this first round pick is top five protected. So if they do somehow win the lottery, you still get Bedard, and that pick moves back to probably 2024, which is not crazy because um, I think they'll really start to improve next year. This is a team that's starting. It's not win now yet this year, but it's going to start win now next year, I think. You're adding pieces. You have Shabbat. You have um, Trickrin now. You added to Brinkett, to Stutzla, and uh, Kachuk. They're building something there in Ottawa. I think they, um, I think they're starting to ready to say like similar to like the Devils and the Wings. Maybe the Devils did a lot quickly in one year, just automatically being as good as they are, but more like the Wings saying, hey, we're getting ready. We'll, we'll ship off maybe some of the veteran guys like they did, but we, if we could pick up a big piece for the future, we're definitely going to jump at the fish to do it. And for that value, absolutely amazing value to give up only a first and two seconds for Jacob Chikrin was awesome and really helps get another very big blue line piece for the Senators for years to come. For the Coyotes, I don't know what to say. I mean, you talk the talk of it being such high value for almost a year and a half to two years now. And you only walk away with no prospects. You walk away with no prospects of first and two seconds. Unacceptable. You needed more. Um, I know you didn't have to retain salary with this, which is why they probably in, uh, they liked this deal. But retain, if you have to retain some salary to get a better deal, I think you have to do it. This was a terrible deal, in my opinion. Um, I really think they, they, they needed more for Chikrin. 
Otherwise, the rest of the trade deadline. Um, the, the Bruins made a move. We'll talk about it, though, in a little bit. Um, there wasn't really too much on the actual day, just a, a lot of minor moves. Um, the only big mo last move that happened actually on the trade deadline happened in the dying seconds, actually, before the, the, the timer hit uh, zero. Uh, the Minnesota Wilds, they got John Klimberg, 50% retained, from the Anaheim Ducks for prospect Nikita Nistenko, uh, Andre Suster, and a 2025 fourth. Um, picking him up um, that close to the deadline was a great add. Uh, Klimberg can be a nice offensive defenseman. Uh, he's going to put up some points. He's going to and, and he helps round out that Wilds defense, which could really the Wild could make a really deep run in the Western Conference uh, for a for a Stanley Cup run. Uh, and this really only just helps that they didn't really have to give up too much. From the Ducks' perspective, he's only on a one-year deal. Um, you might as well get what you can. Um, two prospects and a fourth. You, you wish you got a little more, um, but it's something. You didn't let him walk for free, especially with how, how close it was to the deadline. I don't mind that. But after the deadline, we talked about Timo Meyer Last night, Timo Meyer played his against the Coyotes. Speaking of the Coyotes, as we just did, uh, played his first game with the Devils against the Coyotes in Phoenix. Uh, and the Devils took a 5-4 win in overtime. Took a little longer. They didn't play great, but ultimately, good teams find ways to win. That's ultimately what they do. But Timo Meyer, in the first period, scored his first goal with the Devils. And really, uh, as the game went on, that line of Hughes, Meyer, and Bratt looked absolutely electric. It uh, looks like it could be one of the best lines in hockey. And, and with the way the first line is clicking with Nico Heischer, Dawson Mercer, Thomas Tatar, um, which has been awesome. They've been awesome. Mercer had his uh, goal, get goals per, a goal a game streak broken. He was at eight uh, games with a goal, which was, I think, second, tied for second all time for somebody under 21, which is absolutely crazy. He was going, if he scored... He would have tied Wayne Gretzky, which is wild, but ultimately he fell short a bit. But still, a fantastic feat by uh, Dawson One Dawson Mercer is only 21 years old. If these two lines are going to be clicking like that, it's going to be very tough for somebody to, to, to come in and defeat the Devils, and especially four games out of seven. So uh, Timo Meyer looks like he's fitting in perfectly, and those, those top two lines, man, they're going to be dangerous. Dangerous. But as we move on, like I said, we talk about the Bruins a bit because, boy, oh, boy, have the Boston Bruins been hot. They have been hot like they've always been most of the year. They had a little lull a bit before the trade deadline, but they've now won 10 in a row. They're t obviously 10-0 in their last 10 games. If you win 10 games in a row, guess what? You're 10-0 in your last 10, 10 games. But their trade deadline, I thought, really helped. Um, if you thought there was any holes in this team, which there really isn't. Um, they got uh, Orloff from the Capitals uh, and Bertuzzi from the Red Wings. Orloff, because uh, like we talked about it before, um, Caps couldn't pay him. They pick him up. It's a great add to the defensive core. Kind of helps fill that role out. It'd be the nice second pair defenseman. Uh, pushes down some of the guys who are still playing fantastic years, but makes their defense, of course, so deep. And um, a good player is going to be scratched a lot in their defensive core. They've been playing fantastic. And then adding Tyler Bertuzzi to that middle six, uh, just a nice veteran guy who can fill in nicely, um, knows how to score the puck, knows how to get into the dirty areas, and um, really, again, just fills out nicely that, uh, that middle six. He already has, a, in, in his first game, he got a point uh, overall. Uh, in 2023, this year, uh, he has uh, 15 points in 30 games. Uh, again, not the guy who's going to put up a ton of points, but it's just a nice veteran who, who can work the dirty areas, do the little things right, and, and really fill out that lineup. Um, again, this, this, this team is stacked down the line. This is probably going to be one of the last runs as Bergeron and Marsha get up there in age. Uh, but they don't want to let it run out because... They saw, they re-signed David Poshnok to an eight-year, ninety million dollar deal, eleven point two five mil per year. Definitely a little more expensive than I thought, but with the year he's having, it's still good value for uh, Boston and um, 
and David Pasternak. Uh, he probably, if he hit the mark, was going to go for 12 to 12 five. It just a, he's a fantastic player, top ten player in the league. One of the probably one of the best goal scorers in the league with 44 goals right now in 62 games, 84 points total. Total package player, defense, points, assists. He does everything right and, and is the easily right now the best player on the best team in the league. But overall, it was it was a hectic trade deadline, man. Um, over a hundred trades in the in the day, trade deadline week, which was a record by far for the NHL. And it's something I want to see more of. I want to see more action on the NHL trade deadline. It's so exciting, so fun, especially in other sports like the NBA, um, like the MLB. Make make it an event, and, and, and I really enjoy seeing that from the NHL's perspective. And hopefully, we get to see more deadlines like this when we come back. Though you, you thought I'd skip out on the Knicks, I, I talked about them. In the beginning of the show, we're gonna we're gonna get to them right after this break. Man, they are on fire right here when we come back on the Sharp Show, ninety nine one FM, WIUX. All right, welcome back to the Sharp Show, ninety nine one FM, WIUX, and the New York Knicks. Man, they are as hot as hot as gets. They have won nine in a row. I repeat that nine in a row, and they currently sit. At fifth place in the East right now with a record of 39 and 27. And last night's victory over the Celtics, they did that without arguably their best player in Jalen Brunson, which was an impressive feat nonetheless. And and this is a Knicks team that I don't think is gonna be the championship. They don't, I think, have that elite star, although if you look at Jalen Brunson's numbers since the All-Star break, or since maybe Janu- mid-January, he's been playing like a top five guard, top three, top five guard, I'll say, in the league. He's been absolutely ridiculous the past two months, maybe. It's been pretty crazy to see um, how he's really stepped his game up um, so recently. Uh, in the month of February, he was averaging 27 points. In the month of January, he was averaging 28 points. So it, since January, he's been averaging, and then in March, 32 points. So he's been averaging close to probably 29 to 28 points per game since January. He's been a top three, arguably, you can argue the best guard in basketball since January. Do you I think he's the most talented guard in basketball. No, but he's been playing lights out, absolutely lights out, making that contract look like it was definitely worth it. And this is a team that I think just, like I said, I don't think they're going to win a championship, but they can put up some fight. They can win a round, I think, maybe two if they're lucky. Um, they got good P. Julius Randle's having a nice bounce-back season. R.J. Barrett's continued to come along. Emmanuel Quickly is a nice piece who could be kind of a firecracker, um, could score in bunches. Uh, Josh Hart was a very good grab at the deadline. At Mitchell Robinson is a nice rim protector who can get boards and uh, do some damage. You got like, and you got good veterans off the bench like uh, Derek Rose who, who've been there, been around the block, can uh, really help these other guards like a Brunson, like a Quickly, um, really help them progress in their game without even playing. And he still will play, but this is, this is a team I think New York needed. New York needed the Knicks to be good. They don't need them to win. I mean, they would love for them to win a championship. It's been a long time. But they need them at least be relevant. They need to have the passion. They need to be rooted for the Knicks. Something to believe in. And I think this team gives them that. Even if, let's say, they, they win a round and they get to this, the conference semifinals and they lose in five, six games, let's say, to whoever. I think that would be looked at as a successful year for the Knicks and they'd be happy and they'd look at the future and say, hey, like we got something here. Like, we got something to believe in. And it's exciting. It's exciting if you're a Knicks fan to see this team really do what they've been doing so well. And it's not like they've won against only bad teams. They've beaten the Jazz, who aren't great. They've beaten the Nets twice, who are a playoff team right now, although they are nowhere near what they were. Um, they've beaten the Celtics twice. They've beaten the Heat. So they have a couple good wins in this streak. Um, they're playing the Hornets tonight. Or not tonight. Um, tomorrow. That should be a win. Um, especially with how bad the Hornets have been playing recently. So the, <coughs> realistically, this the, the streak should get to 10. 
Then they have a tough one in Sacramento and both Los Angeles teams on the road. So those, those I think, will be um, very key to deciding on how big or how, how where they sit, really, going on the road, going to the West Coast, see how they do there. But you can't take anything away from this Knicks team and what they've done so far this season. Again, they said the fifth seed, do I think they're going to be a two, top two, top three seed in the Eastern Conference? No, I think they'll cool off a bit. I think they'll sit around that four to seven range. But this is a team you got to watch out for. This is a team that you can't take lightly. If you're the Sixers, the Celtics, or the Bucks, you you got to come to play when the Knicks are in town or where you're going to MSG. This is going to be a tough outing. They're going to give you their all. And it's going to take it's going to take a good effort to beat this team. So you, you can never count them out of a game. They, they got a lot of scoring from a lot of different places. They might not have a most well-known guy, but with the way Jalen Brunson's playing, that contract, if he continues to play like this, this guy, that contract could look like a steal, man. Could look like a steal. But that's going to do it here for the Sharp Show this week. Hopefully everybody's got a great sports week last week. Hopefully everybody has a great sports week this week. We got so much. We got conference basketball tournaments galore. Who, who's securing their spot in the NCAA tournament? Who's going to get knocked out? More NHL. More NBA. NFL, the, the franchise tag deadline's coming up. And free agency. That'll be a huge, huge, huge part of next show as um, free agency is set to start next week. And then we got... Um, MLB continues to move along. World Baseball Classics coming up. More spring training come the way. Great, great time to be a sports fan. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, uh, listening on WIOX. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. I've been Josh Sharf here on the Sharf Show on 99.1 FM WIOX. I will see you on the other side.